I think what we can do to kind of get started tonight is do a little bit of like a warm up icebreaker to start kind of thinking about or to kind of open up questions a little bit. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here real quick. Let's see, desktop two. All right, can everybody see my question for this evening? Uh, any recent R wins? So have you recently learned something new that's been beneficial? Have you uh, figured something out that's been uh, taking you quite some time? Just any recent R wins that people would like to share? I've been working with a package called Tuber to uh, work with the YouTube API and it's been a lot of fun. Never used it before. Yeah, I've worked with it with the YouTube API before and I, I've come across Tuber. Um, I think it's a I think it's a pretty good package. Um, it's, the API is just it's hard to work with. So if you have any like if you if you have any questions about it, I've I've done some stuff with it, but that's cool. Excellent. Glad that's working out for you. Anybody else? Any other R wins that people? Um, I don't know if it counts as an R win, but I did think of a package idea that I'm excited about so I can start to try and apply this knowledge to something. Um, there's this technique um, within structural equation modeling called vanishing tetrads. It's this way of trying to distinguish between different types of measurement models. Um, there is an implementation in R, but I think it's rather limited. So I'm thinking of creating my own package. Excellent. That's great. That's great to find those kind of ideas of where you could see where this knowledge directly applies. So I'd be interested to see how that kind of development goes as we go throughout the group. So me too. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> Please do. Who else? Does anybody else have any R wins that they have? Nobody else? I think my R win was it actually came up with some of the materials that we'll talk about today was with this lib paths argument. So I've been I've been working for a package internally at work. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to share it here, but um, part of that package is to make uh, connections to different data sources on other systems a little bit more streamlined. And I learned how to put SQL files into your package using the ints folder. But I was struggling with this idea of lib paths um, when it was when the package was loaded on somebody else's computer. And so there was some direct application of this. I granted I didn't figure it out, but I think Tan, uh, people who are familiar with Tan, who's who's a mentor in this in the Slack, he really helped me out <laughs> this week. So um, I really appreciate his kind of feedback on it. So that was definitely a win because. That was several hours kind of sunk into trying to figure out what's going on. So great. Uh, last chance. Does anybody else have any other R wins that they'd like to share for this? I was going to go ahead. I was, I was going to throw in. So John concluded the R for DS cohort five uh, meeting on Saturday uh, afternoon. That was uh, that was uh, great to see his presentation. If anybody wants to see John talk about the R for DS community and all of the various uh, uh, connections that we have. Uh, that was really awesome for his presentation. And then uh, Lucy uh, Brennan, uh, Brendan Brennan uh, is part member in the R Shiny uh, or the new Mastering Shiny cohort that Lucy is uh, facilitating. Um, I am co facilitating with that, uh, trying to add uh, being through it once already uh, the focus of attention throughout each of the sections. So um, that was nice to see a, a a new cohort beginning on Saturday as well. That's excellent. That's that's great. It's always good to see those book clubs, especially R for DS, because that is like a thirty. I remember when we went through it; it was like a thirty to thirty-three week commitment. And so that is just kudos, kudos, kudos. Um, excellent work. So um, we're already kind of at eight oh six. So I appreciate everybody sharing. Um, so what we're going to do tonight? Uh, we're going to uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan to um, cover chapter four. Um, many of you probably saw my message in the Slack group that um, I was a little overzealous. I thought we could get through three and four in one evening. Unfortunately, that was not the case. So I did have to move the schedule a little bit. Um, you know, just please review that Google sheet. You know, if me moving it has, you know, uh, caused you to uh, cause that date no longer to work, just let me know and just take your name off of it. And then I'll make sure to fill that with either myself or somebody else. So 
I appreciate everybody being flexible, you know, because scheduling is kind of fluid with the book clubs. Uh, a couple other few reminders. Most people are aware of these, but just to keep this top of mind, uh, if we need to slow down and discuss, just let me know. Uh, let the speaker know. Let Ryan know. Uh, I know Ryan pretty well, so I, I know he's he's pretty comfortable with people, you know, interrupting and asking questions, making a comment, so on and so forth. Uh, if you have a question, most likely someone else has that same question. We're here. We're all here to learn. So, um, you know, please contribute where you feel you need to contribute. Camera is optional, but encouraged. Sessions are recorded and uploaded to YouTube, and that's pretty much the reminders for this evening. So. With that, I'm going to mute myself and I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to turn it over to Ryan. Awesome, everyone. Thank you, Colin. And thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Let's share screen. And I'm going to do desktop two and share. All right. Uh, if I need to increase the size of the font, please let me know. Um, I think I've got it turned up large enough at the moment. Um, but if it needs to increase in size, don't hesitate. So I finished up last week with the chapter three um, system setup, and we were talking about the various environmental uh, uh, operating systems and what, what OS version are you using and what our studio version, what et cetera, uh, uh, in, in, in support of package development. Um, I'm still troubleshooting the Big Sur output. Um, I think I know where that may be coming from, and it's this environmental thing, but I'll, I'll talk about that later. In chapter four, we're going to talk about package structure and state. And I didn't, there should be two more learning objectives here. Uh, Colin, I will update this and try to do it ad hoc while we're talking about them. But we want to convert an implicit knowledge, what we've learned so far, to an explicit knowledge to create and modify our packages. So what this chapter is intending to do is give us a, a foundation of comprehension, springboarding from chapter three, uh, and then focusing on the varying types of package forms that we may run into uh, and possibly share with our, our uh, colleagues. We'll learn about the various states of a package. Uh, there's a really awesome diagram that we'll see here in a moment uh, that gives us a good idea of the, the, the various states. Identify the differences between a package and a library. <laughs> this is huge, um, and I didn't catch it until we I read this section of the chapter, and then it dawned on me why this is important. Uh, what we're trying to specify here is the definition or terminology, and I, I used the term vernacular, uh, our, our, our language use of these terms, we need to make sure that we separate them. And then finally, the last is understand uh, the use of the R build ignore packet, uh, R build ignore file. I would also add in here is to uh, install ignore. Um, so we'll briefly, briefly touch on uh, R install ignore. And that has more to do with your versioning of packages, um, the major, minor, and patch versions of uh, RStudio and also the packages associated dependencies, et cetera. So let's keep going here. Um, Colin, I'll try to add those in when I push this, uh, do a PR for uh, chapters three and four. Okay, moving on. All right. So package states. When you create or modify a package, you work on its source code or source files. Think of this as the uh, textual form. It has not compiled into some computer language or, or some format that is inaccessible. You're working on the source media and you have direct control on its uh, generation and, and, and production level. It's, it's compiling and sending it out to the world. You interact with the in-development package in its source form. Our packages can be in five different states. The first one is the source form, and that's in, in raw, editable form. Literally, it's plain text uh, uh, entry. It has not been compiled yet. Uh, in fact, its folder structure is kind of very specific. You have your bundled form. Uh, bundled is often where we get the TAR extension. Um, tape archive is what TAR stands for, if you're familiar with acronyms. Uh, the binary form is when we compile it specific to a version of operating system, and we'll see the differences between Windows and Mac. Um, it's already implied that Linux, you should already have the tools to compile it if required, but on Mac and Windows as a package developer, you may have to bundle it uh, or, or, or compile it in its binary form to pass it over to a user. You have the installed type, and that's obviously 
pulling it from a repo like CRAN or, or some other uh, repo, or even your GitHub uh, type dev tools install from, from GitHub. What we're going to do is pull that binary down and then install it into our, our library, uh, this, this directory of, of source. And then finally, in memory is when you explicitly call it in a script file where it says library some package name. And what we're doing here is making it available to your search command and also uh, uh, in memory. So as you're running a script, the uh, kernel itself, the, the R environment that you're working in can access uh, all of the uh, functions within that library, excuse me, within that package. Uh, functions calls like install packages and dev tools install GitHub move a package from its source to a bundled state or to a binary state and finally into the installed state. Functions like library, just by itself library, bring your package from its library directory into memory or into your uh, current working environment. Okay. Makes it available for immediate use. Anybody have any questions on the five states of how a package can live? Um, specifically, we're gonna find towards the end of this chapter, the binary state is actually, uh, is there a, yeah. binary state is what is in CRAN, I think. I'm pretty sure that statement is true. Uh, I've got a thumbnail in one of these sections where I actually went and followed a, an example in the book. Um, I've never, actually downloaded a binary from CRAN by itself. It's usually just install packages, letting the system uh, take uh, command of, of that process. By grabbing it and installing it, I could run a you know dev tools install and we'll see exactly what that instruction does here in a moment. So let's keep moving. All right, so in this next point, what we're doing is splitting up those five different uh, areas. Uh, what I was mentioning to Colin, before our, 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 before our presentation started, um, I had already written half of this chapter. So the last couple of days I finished writing it. Um, and I, I now conclude what the intent of these different sections were doing. So we're giving more information about the source form. So a source package is just a directory of files with a spe uh, specific structure. Source packages contain a description file and an R directory containing .R files. Uh, that's where you actually start to build your scripts, right? Uh, some of our group have mentioned authoring or writing packages. I was thinking when I made that sentence, Isabella and Rex. Um, and I think, I couldn't remember, Aaron or Brandon, did, you, did either one of you mention that you have written packages in the past uh, specific to anything? No, no. I haven't. Okay. Um, where I was implying the, the statement of, of some of us have, have already been authoring media is this may be uh, regurgitation for you, for others, um, myself included, this is all new, new material. Uh, many, let's see, many of this is a new subject, therefore you can view source files by first navigating to CRAN uh, and by extension uh, to its source repository. Uh, please correct me if my termino terminology is incorrect. Um, I was making a reference to myself that I'm open for critique for those users that are more familiar with this process. Um, examples of CRAN landing pages would be the 4CATS or the Read XL. Um, these are hyperlinks in the textbook. They are full URL paths. Um, when I push this to our repository and everyone can get access to it, um, these are active links. Uh, examples of a GitHub or a GitLab equivalent version storage. Um, and again, these are different URLs. And if you would like me to navigate there, I can, but um, the first two are going to CRAN, the second two are going to their GitHub repos. Uh, some maintainers fail to link their source projects. This was a, uh, this was a statement in the uh, textbook. In this case, Google is your friend. What I always try to do when I'm searching for a package that may not be directly on CRAN, maybe it's a side project, somebody has developed it on their own. Um, classic example, uh, Calendar. I think Calendar is not on CRAN. Uh, there's a group in South America, I think, that is producing that. I don't think it's Brazil. It might be Argentine. But there's a, there's a calendar package that I've shown interest in, uh, and I don't think it's on R. I think I had to search it, and I've been using the Google form or their GitHub page uh, form of it. 
If a package is not developed on a public platform, you can visit its source in the unofficial or read-only mirror maintained by the R Hub. Uh, I wasn't aware of this link, but I believe it's a it's a not a backend. It's a, it's the underwebbing of of Cran itself. So it's like the unofficial versions of repo. Okay. I would encourage you to navigate here. I'm just going to do it anyway. I'm presenting, so we're all going to take a tour here. Let's see. Yeah. So this is the source mirror. It's not our classic CRAN that we would be familiar with. It's it's another um, replicated storage of it. Uh, but here you can get uh, maybe past packages or things that are not uh, readily available directly from CRAN. So we've talked in other book clubs of if you're in the is it biochem, bio something, there's other mirrors that you can point your, your uh, package uh, uh, library to. I'm sorry. You can pull from other, other libraries, other repos. Anyway, I'm going to continue because I'm stumbling over my words there. So, Ryan, when you're, um, yeah, you ahead, mentioned sir. mirrors there, I, yeah. I know of the other one, and we're going to get to binary states here in a second, our binary packages. I think Microsoft now has a mirror oh, of CRAN, I think. Oh, okay. okay. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. I think Microsoft has a complete mirror of all CRAN packages, and they provide, and I, and I could double check it, so somebody please correct me if I'm wrong. But you can, you know, pull package packages in the binary state through like a Microsoft kind of mirror of Koran. And so I don't know. So if somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. I know we do it for one of our projects that we work that we've been working on. But you know, there's a lot of different mirrors out there. But I just find it kind of interesting, like someone as large as Microsoft is doing that. So. Well, if you don't mind me uh, sharing an opinion, this is not a uh, uh, legitimate um, written text here. I'm just throwing out my own two cents. I always am cautious if it is not a well publicized or well maintained repo. Um, I don't have any fears of, of anybody getting involved and in possibly injecting malware or any other forms of, of uh, uh, hacking code, right, or, or um, bad text, bad, bad code into your, into your libraries um, for a fully recognized or fully uh, functional library. Uh, I'm confident that uh, we have checks and balances to prevent that from happening. If you go to a mirror that isn't uh, overly well-maintained, it's easy for that to take place and you don't even realize it. Um, you utilize it. It's, I don't know, I'm, probably making some really bad um, assumptions on my own part here. So for me personally, I am always cautious of where I'm navigating on the web. If it looks weird, I probably won't exercise its use. Um, and then I'll well, figure out, yeah, go ahead, sir. Well, I, I, I think, and I think Isabella, I think you work for our studio, correct? I mean, yeah. um, I think you've mentioned that in the past. Um, they also have, a mirror too as well don't they like they have a separate mirror that you can pull packages from outside of CRAN correct uh, it's called the RC Serial package manager there's a oh sorry go ahead oh yeah and the public version is exactly that and I think it also um, does libraries or packages from Python I don't know the right term for, for Python uh, as well from Py Whatever the Python equivalent of CRAN is. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, I, I know what you're referring to. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm losing my terminology as well. Um, we just talked about that briefly. The, uh, the other examples we have uh, were mass and car. And I, I don't, these are, if I'm hover, hovering over them, uh, I think they're direct GitHub links, but it's CRAN mass and then CRAN car. Um, I can go to those links if anybody is curious of what these are. It says, note the mirror is not the same as exploring the package's true development venue because the source and its evolution is just a reverse engineering from the uh, packages CRAN already released. I, let's go to this real quick. I think this is a GitLab or GitHub page. Yeah, this is not what I'm referring to. I think the GitHub docs is what they were 
sorry, R hub docs is the reference that note was making uh, in, in, in use. And now that I just did that, I lost my space. Uh, this note here is in reference to that R hub docs. Um, the mirror is not the same as exploring the packages true development venue. Um, it's just a decompiled or, or um, different view of that same package reverse engineered of that same package. The comment is that the, the core bones of what you're after is there if you require it. Um, it just doesn't have a lot of the other additional features that would come from a source file format. Okay, keep going. All right, bundled packages. Bundled is the next form. <clears throat> In bundled, what we're doing is compressing the file and then we're compressing it a second time. We're archiving first and then we're compressing it further. So by extension, we have these two forms called a tar and a GZ format. Sometimes you will hear people call these tar balls. Um, what we're referring to is it's, a, it's an archive file, a tape archive file. Uh, and then we also take that archive file and then compress it further using a GNU zip format. Um, and that's where you get the tar GZ. When we are using this, um, a bundled package is not source nor installed, but rather an OS agnostic storage medium. So it's just a single compressed file format that you can lob over to another user. If you need to bundle a package uh, you're developing, you can use the dev tools build and that will bundle it for you. Uh, comment here if too long, don't read, TLDR. The DevTools build calls uh, package build build under the hood and ultimately to the R command build. I love in a moment after I get past this, there is going to be a figure that will make this so, so obvious of what that statement or that sentence implies. Okay, we'll see that in just a moment. For more information, you can look at uh, building uh, package tarballs. Um, I really uh, enjoyed in, in academia, uh, dealing with uh, tar GZ files when I first discovered what they were. Um, and so I, I made a, an extension here at the bottom. I said, quick explanation, uh, what you're doing when you make a uh, uh, decompress and then unarchive, uh, what you're doing is passing an XVF format. So it'll be tar XVF. Uh, what that means is X is for extract, V is for verbose, I said it makes you feel happy because you see something uh, being uh, uh, printed to stand out. And then F is the, the same file name. If you want to change it, you can. Otherwise, it just uh, unpackages into its uh, uh, directory form of the same file name. Okay. Um, I wish, I wish, I wish somebody would have explained that a little bit more to me of how to use the manual pages um, of a lot of these Linux extensions at an early stage of my learning. Um, I now understand uh, more in, uh, implicitly what exactly this XF, uh, XVF stands for. Uh, Windows users, I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to do this via command line. Um, there is no direct utility built within the Windows environment. When I wrote that, I paused for a second because there are services as of Windows 10, there are more Linux-esque or Unix, we'll even say Unix-esque, packages or, or utilities built within your, your environment that does access it. Um, I did want to make sure that I wasn't uh, misconveying this. If you are anything of less than Windows 10, Windows 8, Windows 7, hopefully you're not on XP, um, you do need some utility to unpackage these tar GZ files. Uh, and, and examples would be 7-zip, WinZip, or WinRAR. All three of them would have the ability of doing this. Um, Note, a bit of research turns up the tar utility has been added to Windows 10 uh, circa 2018. So if you are running, I don't have the exact uh, build of Windows 10, but they did add that in. And by extension, if you are running a Windows subsystem for Linux, um, you should have those uh, utilities available as well. Okay. Um, comment for everybody. Um, I am usually agnostic to an operating system. I do work on all three versions. If you are uh, running into any conflict with your current working environment, please don't hesitate to call. I will be more than happy to spend uh, some time in, in gaining some bearing and possibly giving you some advice on direction of, of possibly how you can correct your uh, uh, symptom that you're witnessing. 
This figure that we're seeing here is more of a directory structure in its various states. This isn't the figure I'm making a, a huge uh, reference towards, but it is important. So what we see at the top here is these are three swim lanes or three columns. Uh, we have our source format, our bundle format, and our binary format. And what we're seeing in each one of these row elements is the directory structure in that current form. So as an example, we will have a description file uh, between source bundle and binary. But if we notice that when we move from bundle into binary, it will actually transpose this or author it into the meta file instead. And I'll have an example of that shortly. Uh, another example is if you had anything in your manual instruction type uh, media that would be compiled using Pandoc or Bookdown or R Markdown or something form to generate as HTML or PDF output form. Okay. Um, R stays the same, source stays the same, or actually source changes to libs uh, in that binary format. Uh, tests do not get included into binary. Uh, vignettes uh, get moved to the uh, instructions or documentation in the bundled form and then into the doc directory for a binary form. So everyone's understanding how this, this column reform of what is happening between these directories, right? Or the contents of the directory. In just a moment, when I get to this next section, um, I have an example that I downloaded for four cats and it is, it's also referencing in that binary form all of these different formats. Keep going. Uh, the main differences between source package and uncompressed bundled uh, are that vignettes uh, have been built. They've been rendered to HTML or PDF or whatever format that you have instructed it to compile in. Uh, a local source package might contain a temporary file used to save time during development. Um, these are I don't know, say unique uh, more optimized forms of instruct or optimized forms of, of uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for functional R scripts um, the, the it compiles artifacts into the source uh, directory any files listed in the build ignore are not included in the bundle so this is a way that we as developers can control uh, what is exported from our source packages into their other forms. Um, I made a reference, I said this is similar to if you were to add this into like your uh, GitHub ignore or uh, get ignore package, uh, sorry, ignore file. Um, when you run a git command, it's just going to exclude it from its process. Okay. It's rare to contemplate the TarGZ structure. However, it is important to understand the R build ignore file. Our ignore controls which files from source make it to the downstream forms. Um, each of the R build ignore is a Perl compatible regular expression. And so we are going to use the hat and the dollar sign to explicitly state or to use uh, regular expressions to format what is included and not included. Okay. So for example, if you were to use the notes as a um, substring uh, throughout your entire package, anything with the word note or notes is going to get excluded. Okay. So a less specific or more automated method is to use the use this, use build ignore, and then add notes um, as a string to that. It has the same effect. Our build ignore is a means to com uh, compromise your development environment with CRAN's requirements. I don't I'm hoping within this book, somewhere along the lines, we start to comprehend the requirements of what CRAN looks for as package developers and submitting to CRAN. Um, what I have found in Isabella or Rex, please feel welcome to voice your comments here. They have, they're very strict in what requirements are needed to submit a package. Um, and it's very quickly that it'll get kicked back if it doesn't meet any of the criteria. I'm hoping this book will expand on that subject. Okay. Files that help you generate, excuse me, the affected files for, uh, fall into two broad semi-overlapping uh, classes. The first ones are files that help you generate uh, package contents programmatically. Uh, and then the other would be files that drive package development, checking and documentation, testing services, et cetera. Okay. 
I do have an example of an R build file. This is not me particularly, it was a text from the book. Uh, so this is actually a bash, I think it is, uh, or maybe I had it as, um, excuse me, I, can't get that. I think I had this as a uh, source script. It's not gonna run, it's just showing you as an example, um, but you would not list the hashtag or dollar, uh, sorry, pound sign with, what's the word, credits, uh, instructions, uh, documentation. So we have the dot R project, um, dot R project underscore, sorry, backslash uh, dot user uh, dot RMD dot MD dot MD. So these are just different directories, but it's looking for that string. Anything that matches that string is going to get excluded. Okay. As a side topic, not related to R, just throwing this out here, doing some JavaScript. Um, I am using a Node.js library. I do not want to source control my Node.js library. Uh, so therefore I've added it to my .get ignore and therefore it doesn't get pushed to my repo. Um, I manage that local to the machine as I'm compiling or building. I do want to version control my source code. It's a similar objective that we're doing here in R with this R build ignore. Okay. All right. The comment text above should not be included in your rbuild ignore file and are only used for explanation. Uh, reminder that the use this, use build ignore is an attractive way to manage this file. So you can do this uh, from a command line format or from a package management format. You don't have to go in and write your own text if required. We're almost done, Colin. Uh, two more, three more. Um, in the binary form of package, <clears throat> We have two different types. The first one would be on a Mac computer, it would be a TGZ, which is shorthand for targz. Uh, on Windows, it would be a native .zip format. Okay. Ironically, again, Windows only recognizes .zip. So um, as of just recently, they've started to use other forms. Linux generally already has the libraries capable of working with binary packages. To make a binary package use, uh, we can use dev tools, build, and then binary equals true. Under the hood, what this call makes is package build binary true that ultimately goes to our command install uh, build. For more information, you can see that build binary packages under the writing R extensions. Um, these are, I, if I'm remembering this link, it is a section within this uh, point, but they're talking more about being able to build and compile from, uh, from binary. Uh, I took a screenshot or I, I felt it important to highlight. Um, this is new for me. I've never exercised this. So this is a, a learning uh, commitment for myself. But what I wanted to show is that in the Windows binaries form, we have the .zip extension. Uh, and then on Mac OS, um, you have different formats depending on your uh, style of Mac process, uh, you have the uh, .tgz extension. So it's matching uh, the previous text that we had above. Okay. Ironically, this download process is exactly what is used or happening when you call the function install packages. Right? You're pointing at a mirror, the mirror is looking for that uh, particular package name. It downloads the binary, runs through and compiles and process, installs it into memory uh, for your own use. Okay. Excuse me. It installs it in your library. When you explicitly say library package name, then it puts it into memory. Uh, decompressing a binary package looks rather different from a source or bundle packages as the example figure that we had in the previous section. The notable differences are that the R files, uh, there are no R files in the R directory. Instead, they changed to a more efficient form of extension. And I want to expand or I want to research these extensions a little bit more. Um, I didn't have time before giving the presentation. So um, throughout this book club, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to expand on what those forms are. The meta directory uh, contains a number of RDS files. The actual help and H uh, help and HTML are used instead of the manual directory. Um, if you had any code in the source directory, it's now changed to libs. Uh, in the windows, they did make a ability to have either a 32-bit or a 64-bit operating system. So you have an i386 or an x64. Uh, directory. Anything in the data is converted to a more efficient form. Uh, the instructions 
directory are moved to a top level um, called the doc, uh, like your vignettes and stuff are, are uh, moved to doc. And then some files and folders have been dropped, such as readme, build, test, and vignettes. Here we go. So I went and downloaded four cats, and I don't have that up above. But when I uh, expanded and then called on a tree output, what we get to see are these different directory levels and then the contents of the files inside those directories. So there's a meta reference and there's these RDS files. Um, the R directory now has this RDB and RDX. And those are my comments to myself. I would like to go research what those file formats look like. Um, the uh, data folder, same concept. Uh, the, the documentation would be like your um, help menus, your manual, your, your uh, manual, how to use the package, your vignettes, et cetera. Um, that's gonna be compiled. So you get your either RMD or HTML output, possibly PDF output if, if uh, uh, it's being routed to a different storage media. Help menus and then find the HTML. Okay. Any questions so far? Does anybody have any curiosity that I have highlighted? I do have a curiosity. Sure. Um, so, okay. I don't know if this is just my misunderstanding of like the term binary. Okay. Uh, so does that mean we're just converting these files into ones and zeros? Is that uh, it would, it, uh, not necessarily ones and zeros. Good, good comment, Colin. No, uh, compiled means that it is no longer in its object oriented programming form. It doesn't necessarily imply that it is in binary zeros and ones, but it could be in a form hashed form that you don't have a, a, uh, editor that can access that binary content. Um, another way to think of this, uh, another, uh, please anybody else feel welcome to jump in to the topic as well. If you were working on a C or a C++ uh, plus plus, uh, program and you compile it, Java program and you compile it, what you may end up getting is a .exe. Now I'm, I'm speaking in the world of a Windows uh, environment when I use the executable extension, but you can't access it, you can't view it, it's in a machine language that is specific to that operating system. So there isn't a there isn't a tool or utility to read and interpret it other than actual some process. So the, the term binary implies that it's been changed to be efficient for the CPU to process. It's not necessarily zeros and ones, but it's definitely not something you're going to be able to read. Does anybody else want to throw in their two cents to that subject? Well, I mean, like the, the thing, because when, you know, like as you expanded this binary package yeah. here, and I, and I mean, you know, I don't know how much value it is to, you know, to dig into this, but like, sure. you know, it is like .html, right? That's efficient for like a browser, right? That's yep. what a browser reads. And so in my mind, when I first was thinking, oh, binary package state, that means you're turning it into ones and zeros because essentially in my mind, and I'm not a computer science major, but it, you know, ones and zeros would be the most efficient way for a computer to read it, right? But we, you know, we as humans can't read it and, you know, you can't send ones and zeros to your browser to, you know, view, you know, manual pages or anything like that. So That's, I guess this kind of, this graphic kind of clears it up for me. It's like, it's not turning it into ones and zeros. It's just a, it's just the well, terminology binary threw me off. So no, sorry. that's a, it's good. It's good. So, so what I was going to say is that if you are, uh, how do I, I'm going to bridge the subject this way and anybody that watches this video or anybody that's listening to me is welcome to critique my, my, my uh, use of terms here. If you were to compile it on a Windows environment and you have DLL and INI files, okay, these are like supporting formats of that executable. It's like extra libraries to assist that program to work. It's not in the registry. It may be installed in the registry, but um, ultimately your, your supporting files are not going to be a form that you can change modifier or access in the Linux Mac environment form of a, of a binary output, a tar GZ file, et cetera, for installation, you're going to call on some level of installer uh, or, or, you know, sh make, make dir, not make dir, uh, make file that will uh, instantiate that, uh, 
that program into your operating system. Uh, so like you know, where you get your bin files and lib files and et cetera files and all these other supporting extensions that get added to the operating system to access and use within your path. Uh, namespace. The the idea between these subjects in that binary form is it's not in a source ability of, of change modification. Um, it's in a, in, a, in a format that's only specific to that use of program. It could be readable, but it's not, it, it's that's where often if you try to open it in a, in a hex, sorry, if you try to open it in a text editor, uh, it's where it comes out all kind of, you know, Unicode hieroglyphic sort of symbology um, and you're like nope close that I can't read that um, every once in a while though you will see an interpretation of plain text and you'll you'll you might be able to gleam some idea of what's contained inside there does that help Colin yeah you open up the text editor it's like wing dings and you're like yep. uh I can't convert yep. it so uh, <laughs> that's exactly correct well, I think this was important and I mean I don't want to dominate the conversation but no. like you know uh like when you start using Docker and you start using Docker to like import your files into like, you know, if you have a Docker system that's set up or a Docker container running Linux, it's a lot faster to pull in the binary, binary files or the 100%. packages as a binary file because it just processes it so much faster. And in my it's mind, my previous mental model was, oh, it just converts it to ones and zeros. But that, like you said, not the case. It's just converting it into a file format that's most efficient for that system to yes. process to get it, to get it installed. So. What is happening with that hieroglyphic bit is the uh, hex interpretation uh, or ASCII character interpretation, the Unicode, you know, eight bit, sixteen bit, whatever whatever format you're using interpretation of that string. So it may be zeros and ones, and it has no way of actually graphically providing that to the user. And so there it just kind of spits out whatever uh, character may represent that string. Um, I, 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 I work on other formats that are more in like hex form, like dat files are an example, uh, like data files. And uh, you can't access them from a, a normal human form, but you can interpret what those values would be. Um, based on a dictionary. Uh, so uh, the parsing of that uh, string of information does represent some library of access. It's just not something that we can, we are human readable, able to interpret. Good point. All right, uh, and everyone feel welcome to judge me if you're watching this video at a later point, feel welcome to contact me and say you are completely not even correct. Um, I'm more than happy to uh, be guided in, in learning on my own uh, use as well. So, all right, continuing. Okay, so let's move to the installed packages. This was actually my favorite part, and this figure was the one that made this whole chapter completely make sense. So installed packages <clears throat> uh, is a binary package that has been decompressed into its package library. Uh, warning, <laughs> uh, complicated figure ahead. Let's discuss what's going on here. Uh, there was a reference to, from the author in the text that says, uh, uh, this is a little bit complicated, but it does make sense. In a perfect world, uh, string together a set of simple rules such as source, bundle, uh, bundle, binary, binary to install. This workflow of how to take it from source, bundle it, binary it, and then install it onto your machine. In the real world, it's a little bit more complicated because there's other tools and uses for how to achieve that. Colin, you already mentioned your uh, your Docker, Docker comment. That's a good example. So what we're seeing here in this particular figure is the different uh, commands that are used in a columnar form is going to be the state of that package. So again, it's source, bundle, binary, install, and then in memory. Now, you'll notice that in memory, doesn't have anything because it's already in memory. We don't have to do any manipulation to it. Okay, it's already been compiled, it's already been installed. So it's just calling it in use. From the uh, uh, mirror CRAN, uh, we can go directly to binary. And then from binary, you'll notice install packages that we use in our, in our script uh, will automatically drop into our command install. It's the same reference that was made at the very beginning of this chapter, and this is why it's so critical, because it's this highlight, highlighted row. Our command install 
literally does everything for you. So the next one example would be from CRAN type equals source. Again, we go from the bundled form, not the binary form, and then it will drop into our command install. If we were to take it from source and then do a dev tools install, it uh, jumps up from source using the R command install and then goes right into an installed stage. The one that I wanted to highlight, and this is important, is the dev tools install GitHub or dev tools build. From these two points, we're taking a source entry and then moving it to the bundled form, staging it first, then from bundled up to our command install. And that's the reference that was being made earlier in the text, uh, how this particular R command install service use, is used. All right, team, I'm gonna be perfectly clear and forward with you in the statement that I've never used R command install before. So I don't even know the tool or reference I would need to achieve that. I have reason to believe it's not gonna be R studio or if it is, it may just be in the console window. I think what we're referring to here is actually working directly with the um, R command line and then doing an R command install directly into that service. So think of like the R Studio IDE window as being this, you know, kind of nice environment that looks familiar to humans. But in truth, if you just want to get your hands dirty and do exactly what is required, you could just drop, drop into your command line and do it from there as well. Okay, the cool part of this process. Can I, can I ask a question about this? Yeah, go ahead, Aaron. Yes. Uh, so when you, so in, in the gray rectangle, when you start with like the, when you go through like the bundle stage, do you just like skip the binary stage? Like, unmute my mic. In that case, yes, you would, right? So if you recall when I was expressing what the bundled form looked like, bundled means that you're just doing a tar GZ. Okay, say like, Aaron, you're going to send it over to Brendan. Um, Brendan, um, you may lob it over to Isabella. It's not in a mirror anywhere, right? Nobody's compiled it. It's not OS specific. We're just putting it in a compressed form to make it easy for shipment uh, over some media, right? I wouldn't say email, but something of that nature, right? Lobbing it over to somebody else. So to answer that question, yes, from DevTools build as a command in that bundled form, sorry, from a source form, it will move it to a bundled form, then push it up into the R command. From bundle, it will skip binary directly to installed because it already has the instructions, right? It already knows how to compile it. You already have the DevTools ability or the arc command instructions to take it from bundled directly into installed. There is no stage of binary because we're not calling on a mirror that's already already produced for our current operating system. I hope I'm answering your question. Okay, yeah, I guess. Yeah, so I think I was confused uh, about what the purpose of binary was. So imagine, think of it this way. Source would be us typing our, our own package development. We're the, we're the developers. Um, we need to lob it over to a coworker or somebody else, right? We're going to possibly put it in that build or bundled form, right? Just a tar GZ file. I need to have it in an efficient way that I could upload it and pass it in, in optimized form. If I were to submit it to a mirror, such as CRAN or some other, other form, then it would need to be in that binary because I don't know what operating system that, that user is going to, to pull it from, okay? Bundled is OS agnostic, whereas binary is OS specific, okay? And then, yes, from- Yeah, so, so I think my question was then why yep. do we need the binary at all? Like, why can't we just always get the bundle from CRAN? I think like, binary is even more efficient than bundled. Uh, okay. as, as, as Colin was mentioning about the Docker comment, um, I understand the reference he's making. If nobody else is familiar with Docker, it's, it's, a, it's not a virtual machine that's just running a hypervisor on top of your current OS system. You're not emulating hardware, you're emul emulating the operating system. The uh, point of that is the instructions when you pull it, 
you build it in a very, very efficient form. You only need the instructions that make it, make it special. Um, you don't need to recreate an entire hardware and, and, and emulated operating system environment to run your code. I just need to access the unique utilities. Um, that's what makes Docker special. But at any rate, to answer Aaron, your question with relation to bundled versus binary, I think it's very much re related to the management of exchange and the efficiency of, of sending and receiving data over that mirror. Yeah, yeah makes sense. Thanks. Good. Good. I'm going to take um, a shot. Oh, I'm going to take a shot in the yeah, dark ahead, too at this too. Is this like why you might need binary? And somebody please correct me if I'm wrong. Does like the does like CRAN and all these other mirrors use packages in a binary state to serve out like the stuff that they have? So like if you look up like a manual or like a manual page or something for a specific package or a specific function and you go like you type it online, does the package need to be in a binary state so that you know those mirror systems can, you know, um, you know what I mean? To serve out because you said it converts it into HTML in a binary format, right? And so my thinking was, it's like, well, is that because it's trying to push it out to, you know, all these other services as well? Don't. Well, I was going to just correct. Don't don't confuse that term binary of zero and one versus the file formats of HTML. So what 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 is happening there uh, specific is when you compile it, um, it's compiled for that operating system, the install packages command already knows what form of operating system you're you're pulling from. And I can go back and show you that's where we were joking about the Big Sur on, on this machine. I know I'm using the upgraded uh, operating system, but for whatever reason, it's telling me that I'm using an older one. My point is it knows it's a MacBook. So it's going to pull the Mac mirror it's going to ignore both. Um, it, you're not going to get a Linux form. A Linux is just going to compile it itself. But um, it, it knows to pull the TGZ or the. Now I'm messing this up because bundled is is binary is OS specific, so it's either TGZ or zip. That's the two choices you have. Your operating system using the install packages of the RStudio development environment or, or IDE that you're using is intelligent enough to already know which mirror to pull from, which package management URL to pull from. Does that make sense? If I were on a Windows computer or a 32-bit versus 64-bit, it would already know not only to grab the .zip format, but also to use the subdirectory of x64 to install the 64-bit version. It's probably not going to be a choice. It'll already be smart enough to know I'm working off of that environment. So I was pulling up the tuber since Isabella had made a comment about it earlier. Uh, what I wanted to do is pull down here to the bottom. And it, you're going to see this across everything um, where we have the targz would be the package source. We have the binaries for Windows, binaries for Mac, and then the old source form would be that Duber archive. Uh, so yes, when we call on install.packages, we are looking at these forms. Um, this might make a little bit more sense, and if you can give me the opportunity, I will extend into overall package management, or at least Unix-based package management, because it might make a little more sense of how this command is happening. Um, if you haven't, if you haven't witnessed it before, it will look foreign. So I do want to gain some familiarity for you, uh, kind of some guided focus on what what this service is doing. All right, I'm going to go back now. Uh, uh, PyPy, uh, uh, Isabel, you're referring to the uh, the uh, PyPy package um, or package management. There's a uh, like There's a long name. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought I thought PyPy isn't the source. I thought that was the way you're installing it. Like you, you have like pip install or is PyPy another one or is that just an actual mirror directory that manages your packages? It calls itself the Python package index, but I have to admit I know okay. very little about PyPy. Good, good comment. I I I have a podcast that I listen to and they make references to PyPy quite a bit. Um, let's go back over here to our presentation. 
we're almost done team i'm sorry for um i am about five minutes out aren't i colin yeah you got about well i mean if, if people are comfortable i mean how much how much more do you have like left? three minutes tops three minutes tops i'll, I'll close okay. it off what what i was making a reference to the very beginning of of our conversation was dev tools as a utility exposes this install hash uh, ha, uh wild card asterisks right so it's a bunch of these packages or a bunch of these options these functions that we can use and as an example we can run a, a library remotes uh, create a variable called funds um, and then use this as characters lsf string package remotes and then grep that for the words install um, so we have install bio c uh, Deps, GitHub, Remote versions, Bitbucket, Dev, GitLab, SVN, uh, CRAN, Git, Local, and URL. So I thought this was neat to witness the other options of install that are made available to us. Um, normally we use install packages and I've seen install GitHub quite often, uh, but I didn't realize there were other features that we could exercise in this case. Using DevTool remote, uh, DevTools and remotes, uh, allows us this function call to make available a wider array of options for accessing or sharing information. Uh, the R install ignore uh, lets you keep files present in a package. Um, an example would be, um, I want to ignore my constant package update because I need this version to operate with. So I can add it to my install ignore and it will not update. So it kind of like breaks the dependencies. Uh, but you have to be a little bit more knowledgeable of what versions of packages relate to each other. Okay. There is a to-do option that I wanted to include in our reference. It says revisit the section later with respect to PAC, P-A-K, um, and we're going to go to pack.rlib.org. Um, I'm assuming that that's going to be an assignment in some later chapters. Um, in memory team is just that. It's made it available within our search path when we call on a function name, whether it be uh, explicitly giving the package plus the function, so you get your double colon concept, um, or if you're just calling the function, if the library is already installed in memory, then it knows that that function is made available. Okay, So we're going to use this, uh, library use this. Um, we have a create package and then new package. So I believe Colin, uh, our team, that this is actually generating a new package. I did not evaluate this because I do not want it to kick out when we are, are trying to compile this later in our, our book. Um, I can go to my R Studio real quick. I don't think it's important. What I would ask the team to do is make sure you nuke it after this. Don't leave it on there because it'll just get in your way. But actually, uh, add the library, use this, and then make a call to create package. And what you'll notice is it will uh, create a very long list of entries that we need to add to. Um, my familiarity to this was the Golem package uh, management, and it does a similar technique. The use this package has been loaded into memory and attached to the search path. Okay, big, big, big capital letters, italics. Uh, loading and attaching packages is not important for writing scripts, but it is extremely important for package management. Right? So we need to ensure that we are uh, familiar with the differences between the two. Um, we, there is a reference to search paths and how to ensure that you're calling them correctly. Um, I'm not going to expand on this topic, but the term is there. Uh, we'll learn more about this in 5.4, Rex, when you're giving the presentation uh, for the test drive with load all, um, how the dev tools load all package operates. Okay. All right, closure, closure, almost done. Um, when we explicitly call library foo, what that does is make it in memory, okay, make it, make it accessible. There is a statement here, the differences between the terms library and package. Library is just that, it is a library with a bunch of books. If we reference the book as being the package, then the library would be the container of all packages. Makes sense. Um, sometimes our team will use these terms interchangeably. Um, the author is asking as package developers, we start to delineate or, or make distinct references to what those two terms imply. Okay. 
Uh, there is a dot libs paths, and Colin, I know we're at the very end of our text, sir, and you made a reference to this importance, but um, my comment was going to say these, these two points are the exact same, but the outputs were different. Um, and I don't know exactly what the paragraph was implying. Um, I said, note to self, these uh, are the same calls. I wanted to expand to our whole group on discussions of what this implies, but I'm running out of time. Um, I did want, I found this last comment to be important. Uh, it's a copy and paste from the text. What it's implying is that uh, by default on Windows, it will already use a user specific path. So in Windows, you have your C users and then some username, right? Inside there is where you're going to get your .r uh, library user. Um, in a Mac or a Linux environment, you would have to opt in or to create these user environments. And a use case of this would be uh, package management. Um, I need to test the dependencies or the backwards compatibility of a, of a, of a package or a, or a our studio or our environment uh, with use of this service. So I may have to create this little bubble, test whatever I need to do, make sure that I get rid of it or, or I leave it there as needed, but keep it separated from my day-to-day -day, uh, work schedule, okay? And then the last statement was talking about version control mechanisms like uh, our environment or PackRat. Um, the statement says that uh, you should install user-based packages, things that are going to get uh, removed and, and, and overwritten with a new updated uh, installation. If it is a minor, you're probably going to have to install your, your user packages. If it is a patch, uh, then you probably are safe. It's just going to overwrite that single patch. And I made a reference down here. Uh, you can read the XYZ as major, minor, patch. Um, so cases were 3.5 to 3.6 versus 3.6 to 3.61. One. Um, one is a minor push. The other one is a, it's just a patch. Okay. Uh, this last statement is just talking about libs and lib users. Um, it's referencing that uh, environmental separation between a active working environment versus uh, something of test use that is specific for dependency checks, uh, backwards compatibility, um, maybe even testing out a user's environment. Somebody puts a, a, uh, a request in GitHub, uh, an issue in GitHub, uh, tracking with a package and you have to go test it out, right? A lot of times you'll hear users ask, what is your environment? What type of, you know, RStudio, our kernel package you're using, version of the package you're using? Uh, when they post that, commitment, you as the developer may have to go create that environment to test exactly what that user is experiencing. So, all right, I'm done team. Sorry for that I ran almost to the very end. No, excellent. It was all, it was all excellent. So I really appreciate you leading the past two weeks, um, especially those, those, you know, system setup and package structure and state. Yeah. Um, and I think you were the perfect person to do this because um, you have a good background in, in some of the stuff. So I appreciate you taking the opportunity to present and, and uh, uh, lead us. So um, next week, uh, you know, before I kind of end the session, I mean, we can hang out and have discussion a little bit more if people are willing to stay and stuff. But I think Rex, I think you're on the schedule for chapter five, correct? All right, great. So Rex will cover chapter five next week, and then we'll just meet as a group, um, you know, to discuss chapter five, and then we'll go from there. So uh, if people want to hang out and discuss a little bit, I'm more than happy to do that. But if people got to go, have, have a good rest of your evening. So, so Ryan, uh, open up. Um, yeah. Can you go back to, I think go back to like the lib paths. You bet. Because I think Here's we can have a conversation about this. Yeah, I don't know. Does anybody have any other questions? Because I feel like I've, I've asked a bunch of questions tonight. So if anybody has, somebody ask a question first before I go, if they have questions. I didn't have a question, but I was just going to say, I have some resources about CRAN that I could put in the Slack if it would be helpful. I have not read ahead in the book. I have no idea if they're going to cover all of it um, as well, but uh, happy to share. Isabella, one of the things that I, I wanted to share, I'm always fascinated with the history of where we're at today, right? So 
Mm -hmm. having a, a comprehension of the tools and resources that were used 5, 10, 15 years ago, and the reason that we're here today using the, the, the tools we have at our disposal, understanding that history always makes it a little more comprehensive of why we need to make a, a, a call a certain way, uh, or possibly a limitation, and, and why a user base is going pushing one direction to to uh, use a different uh, service, I always found that interesting, and I would be more than willing to read any any posting uh, to that subject for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting you mentioned that. I feel like my understanding of the history of Cran is like through occasional tweets and like that become threads with like some commentary and I'm or like, even oh. a debate yeah yeah <laughs> somebody's debating about something I'm like, I'm like oh clearly I missed a lot of however <laughs> many years but, but um point. yeah definitely I'll keep an eye out like these are more like you know how to's as, as oh sort of, sure but, yeah that's uh, awesome if I run into a comprehensive history of Cran oh that'd be super neat awesome. and I will definitely share thank you and thank you so much for the session. Awesome. Yes, you bet. Oddly enough, I think I've 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 come across a history of Cran somewhere. Like there was a paper, maybe it was a history of R, but there's something out there that I've seen. And I remember I tried reading it one time. I'm gonna find it for sure. But no, any any information you have, you know, dump it in the Slack. You know, more information is is great. So I, yeah, dump it in there. My, 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 my only thing, and this could go for any person, if you do add this to the video on YouTube, my only thing for any computer science or, or data science person uh, discipline, the reason history is important is history repeats itself. Computers are really dumb machines. The only thing that changes is the efficiency of how fast it processes. So we still do the same things that we did 60, 70, 80 years ago. It just does it a lot faster and nobody really pays attention to it. And that's the that's the key. So if you if you comprehend the com, uh, the understanding of what it does from a really early stage, then all of the changes that have made it more efficient, it kind of starts to make a little sense. So if if I wish I would have taken that advice from somebody like twenty years ago, it, it would have probably made my life a little simpler in in comprehension. Uh, it's a lot of trial by fire, trial uh, uh, trial by error. And I am learning much, more, much faster keeping that thought in mind. Any other questions for any other questions that people have before I kind of <laughs> dominate more of the conversation? But I'm going to head off. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Thank Rex. You. We look forward to you. Yep. See ya. See you next week. So uh, right. I posted that Microsoft thing sure. that I came across. So supposedly there's like every, every it's called MRAN. So okay. every day Microsoft takes a, uh, a snapshot of everything on CRAN. Right. And so what you can do is you can like roll back to pretty right. much any package version that you want. I haven't really used it, but I just know, I remember reading it one time that they, that they like do a snapshot, you know, and I think it's partly because they're trying to, I don't know the pure intent of this, but my guess is, is that they're also trying to get into the space of like cloud computing and, you, you know. I, I know I, I come across as a crazy Microsoft person all the time, but I am always extremely hesitant in buying off hook, line and sinker to anything that uses the Microsoft term on the front of it. And I, if, if this recording is cut off, that's fine too. I only make this statement because there is a hidden agenda of reasons why Microsoft follows a certain path. I avoid the, the, the use of that term. GitHub has always been open source, right? GitHub from the dawn mm -hmm. of time was always open source. Microsoft acquired GitHub in 2019. And one of the first things they did was start closed sourcing a lot of the uh, features of GitHub. Like you have to pay extra money to use these, these services. And you're like, well, it's, it's always been there. Why do I have to stop using it? Right. It's like changing your ability, like give us more money. And immediately within the open source community, everyone started moving their packages to GitLab. GitLab has made a commitment to the community that it will always remain open source 
regardless of who acquisition acquires, like it's in the, the DNA of their, of their business model. I'm not passing judgment on Microsoft. I have conflicts with what Microsoft does with open source tools to create a closed source field of, of thought, um, non-accessible field of thought. There's an Oracle backup mechanism, and I can't think of the term. It's, it's, it's not Godzilla, but it has something to do with a gorilla. And it's, hmm. a, it's a backup. It's a, back, it's a one-day snapshot of an active Oracle database that makes it available to test, modify, change, access, do whatever you want with the media because it's not going to matter. It's not, it's not real anymore. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll think of the term here in a moment but it sounds similar to what this particular service is doing. How do you, how do in our studio, how do you call on a different mirror? There's a, there's a command that says, don't use CRAN point at this other location for downloading from. And it may even be in these initial instructions here. CRAN time machine. Uh, I, mean, I think you have to download, I think you have to install like it. I think it's the checkpoint package and then you can use checkpoint to, you know, I see. Um, I mean, well, that's the thing is like, it's, there's many different ways to get like packages, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, whether that be through like getting the source through GitHub and then going mm -hmm. through that, like the state and stuff. I mean, the other thing that I was trying to bring up too is with the, with the comment of like the Docker container was, yeah. you know, we were, we were trying to install packages onto a on, onto a linux you know docker container and mm -hmm. it was taking so long because it had to go through that process of downloading the packages and then um you know had to go through that process of downloading the packages moving from what is it a bundle to a binary state yeah because no it would be it'd be moving it from yeah. so then basically it so there's ways that our studio has that you can call just direct a binary file mm -hmm. and so then it just makes it go so much faster like i remember what this one docker container we had a lot of dependencies our packages granted i'd like to you know whittle that down it would take 45 minutes to an hour to build okay you know and but then once we moved over into getting the binary files for it 20 minutes it was like the the speed of of like downloading the packages in a binary and it was, state. Yeah, the same information just in a more optimized form. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, and the other issue is just too is because you have package dependencies, right? So if you like, like bring in like Lubridate, you're also going to have package dependencies on Lubridate. So then I had to bring in those packages as well. And yeah. So good point. Speed it up by going binary by you know. Yeah. So um, you know, it, it this stuff, you know. I find it to be important, you know, and you don't really know it's important. until you get to that situation no. where you're like, wow, why is this taking an hour and a half to build? And then you're just like, then you're trying to figure it out. But if you kind of know that like the different states of a package, it kind of helps you understand, like, yeah. if you do get in that situation, you know how to optimize it and make it faster. I wish I, I would have known that about a year ago, but. Well, I just, I just realized I should have uh, made a comment and I, uh, yeah. There's a, there's a comment at the very bottom, the, literally the last sentence of this presentation. It says, note, library should never, ever, 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 ever be used in a package. You don't use library to call another dependency on another package, right? So um, it, it should never be called on. There's other mechanisms of dependency checking to ensure that when a user of our developed package were to install it, that those dependency checks would be accessible from another mechanism. If you make a direct script call that says, I'm going to install this library and then by extension, install another library, it's that's almost like a security breach. It's not necessarily what it's saying, but um, that is a very efficient or inefficient way of, of loading your, your uh, package. Um, I wouldn't even call it lazy loading. It's just, you should never do that. But I, I realized- well the presentation's oh, ahead, over. No, the presentation's over and I didn't I didn't make that comment available. We can, I hope we they... can bring it up too. We can bring it up next week. But let, yeah. that that's it. well, it's going to come this is going to come up again. Like I've already kind of read ahead yeah. and then this is going to come up again. And okay. it's going to come up with this idea that a package should be a self-contained 
you know, it should be a self-contained like container. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you're calling library in your package, what you're doing, and again, I still don't totally understand it, but I kind of do. So if I get it wrong and John, you don't cut this out and somebody's watching this later, if I'm wrong, <laughs> sure. my mindset might change. But what it's doing is, is that if you make a library call within your package, what you're doing is you're, you're interfering or you're changing the state of your user's computer, specifically or their computing environment and their I setup. See. And so when you have a library call, it's going to say, okay, you need to install these other packages as well. Like terminating their, yeah, oh, no, it's like the Terminator, like, like you're just going in and doing whatever you want versus what the user is, is intending for it to, to do. Exactly. And so it mess and so it's going to talk about in the book about like the search path, right? And so we're going to talk a little bit more about the search path and and yeah. having a library call inside of your package is going to influence your user's search path. And if you do that, your user is going to have this expectation that their search path is what they've ex expected it to be. But if you've manipulated that with this library call and they're trying to call certain functions, they don't work as expected, then it's just going to be confusing and it may have, you know, adverse effects as well and so um i think i think that's what the book was getting at but like we're going to get to it so if we don't if we don't talk about it next week well it's yeah. going to come up again so when i when i ran this particular lib uh package this uh, sorry this this call uh what i what i wanted to show you is in our studio and i didn't i, I realized as i was talking i was going so fast or uh didn't didn't hit it uh correctly but let me run this real quick. So what I noticed is I've got R Studio version 4.1. Now, I don't, I don't think that I, I, I have reason to believe that this is not, this is not my R Studio. This is the R kernel library version. I, I need to confirm that. And the way I would go about it is uh, uh, help about R Studio. So right now, our studio is 1.4, uh, at least on this machine it is. But if I run a R sessions version, uh, so terminal, or I don't think you can do a console. Let's try terminal real quick. And I say R version. This is telling me that I'm using 4.1.1. So big difference, R studio is just your nice, happy place that you can develop in. R is actually the language you're you're uh, managing, and a good reference to this would be if you're using Python, um, you can use Sublime, uh, Atom, uh, 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 PyTorch, uh, not PyTorch, Py. What's the what's the other IDE that Py, uh, uh, Python's always big on? Starts with PY, but it's a it's an IDE. Yeah, that's all fine. That's just like your your window dressing, right? Whatever kind of vehicle you want. You got four wheels, an accelerator, and a steering wheel. I really don't care what manufacturer you're, you're using to drive in. The engine or the fuel that you're putting into it, the um, <laughs> the vehicle itself, uh, that's it. That's the the scripting language that is doing the heavy lifting for you. So, if our studio is version four point one. We don't really concern ourselves with our studio. Our studio is just, that's just the, the, the it looks nice. Um, doesn't matter. R is actually what we want to want to manipulate here. But I have yeah, reasonable. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to, I was going to, I was going to extend that comment to, I'm curious about the tidy verse in its use of our studio as a service to the that developer, the, the the person that's that's you know your daily driver, the 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 one that's doing all their data science statistically stuff, is the tidy verse and, and tidy models highlighting our studio as a software package, or can I run the same services in my R session instead? Well, you should be able to. I, I would mean, think you should. You should. I, I don't, mean, I don't know if it would look different. I mean, like there are certain packages that, you know, have some functionality that can be added to your R Studio session. Like I'm thinking of like Blogdown. Blogdown yep. gives you certain add-ins. So if you look up on your top right, there's an add-ins yep. tab up there. Yep. But you, I, I would assume that you could still use, yeah, you can. I mean, because I, I've done that all the time. I've done that before. Like you use an R session in your like, 
like you can use an R session. I'm thinking of like in a terminal or like a server environment, okay. like you can use your R session, you know, and I'm sure those packages are going to do the same functionality that you would have. Yeah. And so, I mean, yeah, I would think so. I was, um, I was impressed to learn and I, I don't, please, I got to be careful here because I'm, I'm, I'm actually guessing I'm not confirming this. I need to research yeah. it to confirm, but same thing uh, for everybody that's watching this later. If, if, right, if right, right. Cut this out. It's like I'm just I'm t- thinking out loud. <laughs> well, do you do you know the electron language? Um, so electron is like yeah, Chromium is a is a is a browser, right? But Chromium as a as an open source utility is actually a method for you to author programs on your machine. So electron would be like this um, ability to write a program, but it's not. It's almost like building an app. Right. It's not a classic executable. It's not a classic, you know, uh, uh, installation service on your, you know, Mac computer or Linux computer. This is just literally an app that's running in its own little environment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Electron is what that is. And it's a, it's a JavaScript extension of being able to achieve that. Um, I need to confirm that statement. What this is important is because when I installed our studio on my Mac, on my Linux machine, on my Windows machine, and on the web server, they were all identical. They all look the same. They still all act the same. Um, Adam in the background, Adam is a, is a GitHub text editing uh, extension, but um, Adam as a text editor uses that Electron package to form this little environment. Slack is an Electron app. Uh, you can run it in the browser. You can run it on your desktop, but technically they're the same mm-hmm. instructions. Um, Teams, Microsoft Teams is an Electron package. I don't mm-hmm. know if they used Electron, but it's a similar concept of this, this app. And that's why it has some really funny characteristics sometimes. If you've ever noticed on Teams or, or noticed in Slack, where it's like, well, that's weird. What, why did that happen? That doesn't look right. Um, it doesn't act the way it should. Um, usually it's because it's just a browser extension that is running or standing, standing alone as a program but it has no direct association to a classic registry or to a classic installed service. Anyway, I'm sorry. I, no, no, you're no, I found you're, that interesting. No, that's, that's interesting. And then, and going back to this point about these, yeah. these two lib paths yes. um, and this will probably be the last thing. Cause I have to go here pretty soon, but okay. like um, this makes a lot of sense. Like if you like set up a server environment, so mm-hmm. like, one time I went, went through the process of setting up a server to do like shiny server to like run shiny. I had no idea of like sysadmin stuff, but when you think about it in relation to like, you have your global environment, like all users and all services on your server can use these packages, but then you also have your individual users are going to also have their own lib path as well. And so that was, I think that clarified it for me was kind of thinking going back to that, like, because the one person was like saying like, okay, you got to create a user in Linux. Okay. Like, yeah, you can install your packages, but the problem is, is that like, you know, only that one user can use it. So what you rather should do is you should jump out, go back to root and then install it globally for everybody. And then, you know, then your services or whatever can just rely on that one package state rather than the individual user. Did you, you know, lip path. in your, in your textbook, did you have or read anything about the wheel service? Uh, it's, it's not a service. It's, it, it's not a wheel directory. It's a wheel object. It's, it's the, it's where you put users that have the ability of accessing other things. So from a sysadmin standpoint, yes, you can create your additional users and you can explicitly tell them what they have or what they don't have access to, or you create this wheel environment that says, Anybody that with these extensions can access all of this media, but if you don't have that, sorry, bud, you're not getting it. And it's not ch mod and it's not ch own. It's 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 different than that. Uh, but it's 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 user rights management uh, in a Linux service. I will find the documentation to that regard. If your sysadmin book hasn't referenced it yet, it should at some point in time in its text. Um, it, it has to because it's such a core element of, of why Linux is special beyond all other um, OSs. Uh, the mm-hmm. idea of how to allow or disallow access to a location or even, even the subject of a symlink. Like, symlink to me blows my mind. 
Um, I'm not a Stargate fan, but the whole time warp, um, the straightest uh, point, sorry, the shortest path between two points is literally a hole, a wormhole from one point to the other. Uh, it's not a straight line like math likes to tell you it is. Um, you just enter this and pop over here on this other side and you never actually left user space. Um, some links are not in Windows hmm. and I think they should be in Mac. Um, I'll have to, they should be. Uh, BSD is a, is a derivative of Unix and so therefore it, it's a close enough brother to the Linux environment, it should also access it as well. Point is, all aside, the user rights management or the application access for a program uh, is very much important. Um, in your www uh, var html, uh, var, var www html, that path of web server, shiny app web server where you're putting your content, that should mm -hmm. be uh, read and execute, but it should not be writable um, because you don't want somebody to pwn or take ownership of that server through an HTML call. So you'll always have 777 as an access point. And that means that it's it's read only, uh, mm -hmm. limited execution and zero, zero writable uh, ability. So. Yeah, I, I vaguely, vaguely remember it because or is it seven seven five five? Maybe that's what it is. Seven five five. Yeah, I, I I remember I remember those those codes. Like you can you can set read and you know read write execute access on. I I vaguely remember that. I mean, I haven't set up a server to do anything like that in that's a long a, time. But well, that's a protocol number. It's a I, I don't think it's ISO. There's a there's a numbering. Sorry, there's a there's an actual instruction what <sighs> those terms imply. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I, I remember. I, I I remember seeing the table, and then I remember playing around with it for a little bit. But yeah, yeah. It it, it it's vaguely. I vaguely kind of remember it. Um. I I mean I don't know. It's in user management. I know it's managing users and permissions. Installing. I remember what you're talking about. It's like setting up your server, create bootable flash drives. No, I don't want to deploy. I want to manage my users. Uh, uh, I don't want to switch users. Yeah. I can't remember the, the, the command to access it. It's wheel. It's, it's like when you go, who am I? And it reports back. Um, and then what, what credibility you have, uh, the, the wheel option gets you to add or remove user rights. These are mine. This is not funny. I, I remember what you're talking about. It's it, oh wait, here we go. Yeah, it's like it's like read is four, write is two, execute is one. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, it's like six hundred. Yeah, 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 yeah. Seven forty, seven seventy. Yep. Yeah. I vaguely remember that. But well, seven five five is web servers. That's what you always you never you never want to have a completely open uh, uh, web server, uh, even a database, even a database backend. You do not want to have it accessible from a, a write or uh, yeah write ability. Um, read is fine. Read you're not going to have any problems. Um, and and mm -hmm. symlinks are your friend because you can you can specify to the kernel it has read write executable access, but from the web servers option it only has read and execute options, right? Um, that sim link is your blockage and, and sim links are so special in that regard of how they operate. That's what makes the, makes the uh, web interface so, so special. Octal point values is what this book defines them as. There we Octal go. point values to manage and modify permissions. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, no, I, yeah. Like when, when, with the lib pass, I mean, you don't really think about it, but then when you start thinking about like it from like a system level, then it makes a lot of sense. It's like, you know, like the lib pass, you're like, Oh, well, I just think about it on my computer, but you're like, well, you got to think about now you got to change your mindset of like your package isn't just going to live on your computer. I mean, it might, mm -hmm. if you're just building one for yourself, but like, if you're going to distribute this out on CRAN, it's like that it's going to be trained. You don't know what's this, like you said, somebody could could try and stuff it on XP. I mean, that's, yep. you know, that's totally possible. You yeah. know, granted, not, are you not gonna... possible? It's probable. <laughs> it's, it's, prob it's probably well, going to happen. Well, last, last thing, cause I got to go here. I'm already, I'm, I'm already kind of pushing it, but um, no, like, uh, 
I, we at, at a university or at a university, and I'm not going to say it because I know this is recorded, but there was a computed, there was a distributed computer service that you could use that you get access to like compute resources with a lot of oh. different servers. It's like you could get access to a supercomputer. Yes. Why I needed access to this when I was thinking about it, I don't know, but they gave access, they gave access and the, the way you accessed it was through XP. Like you were using like a, you know, you were, you were using like oh, a virtual session that was running desktop. XP. Yeah. 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 Remote desktop. Interesting. Yeah, so I, opened, I opened it up and I was like, whoa, this is XP. So, um, but I mean, maybe that's just the, maybe, you know, Interesting. I, I don't know. I know nothing about supercomputers. Don't ask me why I was, why I needed it or why that I asked is, for access well, to it. But the whole Azure cloud has me all sorts of triggered. I I'm, I'm all, I, I don't, I don't have Azure. I don't develop on Azure. I don't even do much with even windows servers. But um, yeah, I, I, from, from one user to another, it, usually if the word Microsoft enters the sentence anywhere, I will usually start to turn away from it. Mm. And it's not because I don't want to go down that path. It's because literally I have made it a choice not to go down that route. I don't use Windows computers. I don't operate on Windows computers. I'm familiar with them. I can do a power user with them but it's not a willing choice for me in a developed environment to, to exercise. So the only, the only reason I have windows is because of work. Uh, otherwise it probably would not even be in our household. So anyway. Cool. Well, I got to oh, bounce. Well. So um, great job. Great job. Uh, and then uh, excellent. Thanks for taking on the responsibilities and um, I'll talk to you next week. All right. You bet Colin. Thank you, sir. All right. Talk, talk to you, to you later. See ya. All right, bye-bye. Bye.